flowers. And I was a little worried, it's so warm. It's been so warm that uh, it was really too early for wildflowers. You need a good freeze before you start thinking about wildflowers. Wildflowers need the cold, that's when you put them out. Oh yeah, uh, I would, had fully intended, I had fully intended to have a handout for you, but I was just didn't make it. So I'll email it to you later in the day or first of this week. But it's a, the the ten steps to putting wildflowers out. It's everything that we're going to talk about today in just one sheet form. So and then also, if you could, yeah, just give me your email. And Ken will make sure you get the link. It's going to be a PDF, so you can easily print it out and have it, or just read it on your iPad or. or Whatever device you like to read it on. It's surprising how many people are reading on digital devices. It's such to the point that over half are reading iPads and, and, uh, and, and tablets, that kind of stuff. And we're having to redesign our website so it's more mobile friendly. So this is our fourth website redesign. So every time we change it, like the technology changes. So we're redesigning that so it'll show up better for you folks watching online. Uh, but that, that'll be out to you shortly. Wildflowers in the mountains of Arizona do really, really well. I mean, really well. Better than, I mean, the folks in Phoenix, Scottsdale, Palm Springs, the Southern California deserts, they wish they could grow wildflowers. They can't. And through a few me Mexican daisies and a few things, but not wildflowers. Not like we have in the mountains of Arizona. And so I'll go over the mixes, what to look for in the mixes. So I would say, first and foremost, let me just get you the, the dangerous part. You're going to see lots and lots of pretty packaging with wildflowers. Don't get mesmerized by the packaging. Most of those are about the wrap and the picture, and they're mainly annual seeds in there. So they'll come up real fast, and it's all filler. It's vermiculite, basically. It looks, vermiculite kind of looks like a seed, but it's not a seed. It's, it's filler. It makes a great stocking stuffer, that kind of stuff, but it's not a... It's not good for garden, your gardening friends. You want better quality seed. You want to save it for the high altitude of, of the Rocky Mountains, this, this high altitude area of the, of the Western, Western Mountains. Those are the seed that you want. And so the seed that we sell here, a buddy of mine, who was a professor up in, in Colorado, his hobby was collecting seed. And so he started this company called Beauty Beyond Belief. And now he's quit his day job. He's just doing this because he's done so well with it. But he carries a top-notch seed, and a lot of them are hand-picked. And so you get pure seed, real seed that are perennial, come back every year instead of all the annuals, so you get a better seed mix, a better take. Now, when you're looking at your seed package, sorry if I just chucked a few things. What I did is I brought a few of my favorite wildflowers that I just have, and then some of the seed mixes. So when you look at the seed mix, this, uh, let's say this, this mix right here, this is the deer-resistant flower mix. So that flower, that picture you see, that's the second year picture. So perennials don't look good the first year. They're green, they're growing, they might put a little color on, but they really need a two-year root before they'll actually start to bloom. That's also just trivia, just so while we're on, we're casual, uh, that's why perennials are more expensive than annuals. Because the farm, at the farm, we have them for two years instead of for just one year. So they're twice as old. So you've got to keep them around longer. And so if you want them to bloom. So the ones you see in the lower greenhouses are perennial house. They're typically a year older or more. Some of them, the big peonies, they're five, six, seven years old. The big Tito uh, uh, peonies, they're hum those humongous peonies. Flowers like this, fragrant. Those can be ancient by the time they finally get from the farm to here, if you want them to bloom. At an annual, the plugs are mine, you can get those very cheap, almost below annual cost, because they're just a plug. That's usually what we take and actually start to plug and grow them on for an extra year before we bring them in the nursery. But we figure here, you're looking for inspiration, you're looking for better nickel for every time I heard I don't have forever to live. I want it to be good now. I want it to be good now. I want it now. So that's kind of what we cater to. So we want inspiration for folks. So this seed, that, that picture is from year two, the second spring. You plug them, you, you spread them, you plant them in the winter 
now for about Valentine's. It's probably ideal, your, your peak window. Because many of the seeds, especially things like poppies, uh, the, the seeds with a very large outer hull, they need that freeze and thaw cycle to crack open that hull so that they will germinate. But the mistake that, that, I'd say the number one mistake folks make with, with wildflowers, they start them in spring when they're planting all their other flowers and they wonder why their wildflowers didn't come up and do well. It's because they didn't have that freeze and thaw cycle so they, ne they never did germinate. The seed's still sitting there. At that point, it's bird bait. So it's just kind of get, they'll be taken by the birds. But if you start now, you have that naturally occurring uh, freeze and thaw cycle. So it makes a difference. You get a better germination rate if you're away. If you're gonna buy them in the summer, for those of you watching this later, and maybe you are in the spring, a little trick if you do wildflowers, um, and if we don't throw out of that freeze and thaw, chuck them in the freezer for a couple days, pull them out, let them thaw for a day, put them back in, do that twice, go plant them, go germinate. So you need that, you can artificially induce, uh, we can, gardeners can artificially induce life, so we can do that. So we got the technology, we got the smarts, but I would say it's much easier just to just have nature do it. The biggest thing with uh, wildflowers, here's a, the, I guess the second biggest mistake. We're in the mountains of Arizona. And so we've got these hillsides. We had some erosion control. We're thinking I can take this package of seed for $22, covers like thousands of feet. It's pure seed, it's good seed. I can just chuck them over the hill and they will magically come up. That's not the way it works. Well, in nature, that's the way it works. In nature, they have millions of seed, and only 1% comes up. If you want a 1% take, that's fine, but that's, a, that's expensive to put out. You, you, you want every one of these seed to germinate and come up and flower for you. So I'm gonna give you that insider tip of how to make sure all of the seed germinates and does well for you and blooms, okay? Uh, so don't just throw them over the hill and expect flowers to come up through the rocks. You need to actually prepare the soil. Not a lot. It's not like preparing a lawn or a garden, but some. And here's the basic setup. Rake the area that you want to put wildflowers in. Just take a nice stiff rake, or potato rake, or just something with stiff tines, and rake the debris and rake the rocks out of the way, exposing the soil. That'll do two things. One, it'll get rid of the trash that's on the, on the, on the ground. Secondly, it will open up the earth so it can receive the seeds better. So you really want to rake it, be aggressive. Just, that, just an inch layer. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to double turn and do all this English garden stuff. This is, this, these are wildflowers. We just want to set the stage so more of them will germinate than, than less of them. So just rake that soil, get rid of all that junk, and throw it over the throw it over the side. Get rid of that. So throw it away. It's no good. So nothing's going to grow in that. Once you have your seed, the soil opened, uh, you might want to watch what's left over because everything's going to grow in that space now. Wildflowers and weeds. So if there's a bunch of dandelions or whorehound or goat head or a foxtail or some other kind of weed. You might want to spot treat those weeds before they take over, because they're gonna grow equally as well, then you've got competition. So try to get it as clean as you can. Uh, the uh, Weed Beater Ultra, that's the weed killer you wanna use now while it's cold. It's the only one that works when it's cold out, especially at the higher altitudes. It's in the store, it's a, it's a broadleaf weed killer. I just sprayed some in a, in a property I've got and things are already wilting and dying. It's only been three days. So a glyphosate will not even touch it. A Roundup-based product, not even, don't even bother right now. It's not even gonna remotely uh, uh, try, to, try to work. It's too cold for it. So the Wheat Meter Ultra is kind of the competitor to that. It's, it's a newer technology, newer salt-based molecule that, that the plant will absorb it and take it in there. It kills the roots and all, okay? The other one to watch, right now we've been recommending fertilizing everything. We've been recommending putting weed and grass preventer down. That's your, those two things you put down now to keep the, the winter weeds from germinating. Whatever you do, don't put weed and grass preventer down where you want your wildflowers to grow. 
because it will also keep the wildflowers from germinating, it keeps all seed from germinating. Just kind of had that mistake a couple times with folks, just kind of, just pre prepare, think, think that through a little bit, okay? Fertilizing's fine, we'll show you which food's better, but just some, some mistakes I've seen over the years, some blunders, I don't want the blunder factor. Today is to make sure the blunder's gone and success reigns, okay? All right, so what do I do? Um, let me start with some of my favorite wildflowers so I can inspire first. Show you some things that work really well in my own yard. This is one that I put out by the mailbox. This is called Gara, G-A-U-R-A. -A. It gets up about knee high or so, but the, the foliage stays very, very low, about that tall, but the flowers elongate, come up and they float above the foliage. It's magnificent. It's a hummingbird and butterfly paradise. I mean, you, you'll see a hummingbird, I mean, racing across a yard and they'll spot this and go, whoa, whoa, come right back into it. They cannot resist, it's like candy to hummingbird. So uh, it is a perennial, comes back every year. Mine is still in bloom, a little, actually I haven't looked at it. Last night it might've gotten burned. The last couple nights, uh, my hydrangeas are completely obliterated, the figs are gone, I mean, things got burned. Not, but not everything, so. But this one I, I think is still in bloom. You can plant that now. You can plant it now. Just as long as you remember, it will be deciduous. It'll lose its foliage, uh, and then it'll come back. Usually in March, April, it'll start to put the foliage on, and then by May, starting to bloom, and it keeps blooming right through the whole growing season. It's amazing. Then you can plant it now. If you're planting now plants, just make sure you water through winter. That's the biggest. That's the. If you plant it a lot summer through fall, make sure you water those plants because they're not fully rooted yet and they will use moisture. So they will actually still, we don't truly shut down here. We're so mild, which is why we live here, right? Uh, so just water a couple times a month. That's all it takes. Yes? What's the difference between a wildflower and a native plant? Wildflower and a native plant, hardly anything. The same, they're about the same thing. Yeah, oh. they can be the same thing. Because there's a lot of things like cara and so forth that are, and you know, like the verbena and all that kind of stuff that are considered wild, are considered native plants for like zero planting, but I never knew they were also wildflowers. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Wildflowers and native plants can be the same thing. If it's pretty and it's blooming, it comes up by itself, I'd call that maybe not native. Native, most of the natives, quite honestly, are ugly. I mean, you don't want them in your yard. I mean, you clear them off, let's face it. But there are some that are glorious. And there's some that are tough in other parts of the world, like Russian sage is our most famous. That's an Afghanistan plant. A Russian general found it while attacked, while trying to take over the planet in Afghanistan. He was a gardener, and he found this proviscia, whatever it is, it's got a Russian name. That's why. But it thinks, it grows in that five to 6,000 foot level of Afghanistan, where they brought it over here and went, this thing is like a weed. It grows like crazy. And it can be a weed sometimes. You let it go. You gotta keep things in check. This one, you're never gonna have just one. I now have three out by the mailbox. It keeps spreading. And that'll be fine. I'll let it spread until I don't want it to spread anymore, and then I'll take a shovel to it. And I'll go, okay, you're either gone, I'll give it to friends, I'll throw it in the trash can, or I'll plant it in the backyard. I'll decide at that point. That's just gardening, keeping things maintained. But gar is a great wildflower. Just wanted to show it to you. And it's best done by plant, not by seed. This one, is, we, we actually take cuttings on this one to actually grow it. Um, this one, not really a wildflower. I treat it more like a shrub. This is an evergreen euphorbia. E-U-P-H-O-E-O, -E whatever. You can look at the tag later, euphorbia. It's an evergreen perennial. This is about, as, this is fully mature. I like it in my flower beds, out my raised beds and stuff, because it actually keeps something looking good in the garden, because it's evergreen. And javelina don't eat this. <laughs> the rabbits don't eat this. They don't eat the uh, garret either. They leave it alone. It's a great, great flower. And so this one does get a flower on it. It's kind of a funky flower. It, it looks like this foliage only, it's like a Dr. Seuss plant. It's very <laughs> unusual. Really neat looking. But the reason the Havelina don't like it, it's got a, it's related to poinsettias. 
we said is also euphorbia. When you break it off, it's got a real milky uh, sap to it, which make, which I'm sure makes it taste bad. They don't like it. But, but euphorbia is a great plant. Um, a weed. This one will take over your garden if you're not careful. I've got this underneath my juniper trees because I've got this big, beautiful spot. I pruned up all my junipers so it would expose the bark and then I uplift the bark. And it's beautiful. I got art in front of it. It's beautiful. But it was kind of, junipers have, are kind of trashy. They're always throwing stuff down so they, they suffocate everything underneath it. Very few things will grow underneath a juniper, but this will. It's a nice, low growing evergreen plant. I just let it go and then it gets some blue flowers on it. It's a nice evergreen. But this one, uh, don't put it in the middle of your flower bed or nothing will be left except vinca. But off to the edge where it kind of gets abused, right there where the irrigation just stops, that's the place where you put your evergreen vinca or in a pot so you can contain it. It wants to creep, root, form another plant. So it keeps forming, keeps spreading easy throughout the earth. Plant. Easy to transplant, just shovel. Pop some out and chuck it someplace and it'll start to grow. Yeah. Okay. This is probably my favorite. It's called Jupiter's Beard. It truly is a wildflower. Um, if you can grow this one by seed very easily. Um, this one, be careful, it will reseed a lot of different places. This is one you want to plant at the top of the hill and then the seed will spill down and come up down there in places. Jupiter's Beard blooms all summer long. Mine has been in bloom until that last storm wasn't a storm. Until it got cold two nights ago. And now it's going, it's starting to, to hibernate at the root zone. But Jupiter's beard is a great drought party. I mean, no water, no care, just dirty looks and speaking bad to it. It, does, it just blooms and blooms. Unfortunately, I'm broken. Jupiter's beard. Every yard should have at least one snapdragon. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't look wildflowery, but it, it is tough. The Havelina rabbits don't eat it. So it's a great look. Isn't that pretty? Mm -hmm. It looks like you should add some ranch dressing, dressing and just have some yourself, but animals don't eat this. And you never get just one. It seems like there's always more coming up magically. Uh, this, this one in tomato plants, where do they come from? They just start coming up in places that you didn't expect them. So that's kind of like that. So, okay. And then one that we sell as an annual, but I've had it perform for me like a perennial. This is uh, Dusty Miller. I've got some that are three years old now. They're up above knee high, about this big. So maybe two, three feet high, two and a half feet high. Solid silver, just solid. And then it's, it's covered in yellow flowers. If they're more mature, they just have this beautiful yellow flower that hovers above all this silver. It's very pretty, very Arizona looking kind of plant. And animals don't eat this. So javelina, I put it out there with a the javelina roam and they seem to leave this one alone. It's like bulletproof. It's because it's got a real uh, textured foliage to it. That's a great little plant. And then in the shaded areas, actually the sun too, I'm having more fun with hookero. Uh, or coral bells is the common name for this one. His little bell, bell shaped flower that kind of hovers above. Evergreen. I like to plant this one at the base of my trees where the emitter, where I'm watering the trees for my uh, the, the drip system. I'll put it right there. I can water this in the same cycle or, cycle or frequency that my trees are. And this one will fill in and give me this underplanting so it doesn't look like my trees are growing up out of the rock. It's, it looks funny having crushed granite right next to your trunks. It looks more natural to have an underplanting. Uh, but this one is not, you know, it's from Firewise. It doesn't take over, it doesn't get too big. It's about, maybe just about ankle high. And that comes in different colors. Burgundies, coppers, greens, yellows. It's a lot of, it's a fun plant to play with. Even plant this in containers. It will eventually get this humongous just solid mass of that. It's really pretty. And this looks good year round. Okay. Two more, then we'll move to the actual seed and the demonstration. You gotta have a mom if you live in the mountains of Arizona. You just have to. They're perennials, they're great. 
just make sure you're planting a, a garden lawn. So we're into this fall season, decorating season, where every place has this. A lot of the mums you see are floral grade. They're grown in a greenhouse where they really won't transplant it very well out into the yard. These are cold hardy and they're made for the mountains where they, they grow outside. So, but I've got some of these, these and asters, kind of companion plants to each other. I've got some that are ancient, three, four, five years old, they keep coming back consistently. They're just great little perennial flowers and count on them. And I don't make them complicated. I don't try to dead head them in midsummer, so I keep more compact. They're garden mums. I just let them do whatever they need to do. And typically they'll bloom twice for me. Usually late summer or the middle of the monsoon season, then they'll push some more growth and they'll have another set of flowers out, out in my own gardens. Kind of depends on the year, but frequently. And then don't count out. A lot of us have Mediterranean or uh, uh, Southwestern kind of gardens. Herbs fit that kind of garden very, very well. So don't discount your lavenders is what this is. Rosemary's, uh, oregano, thyme. I've got lots of creeping thyme because it stays low. It blooms often and they don't mow it hurts. So we've got entire lawns built with nothing but thyme. It's a great creeping, creeping kind of thing. I think this is uh, English. I don't know. Let's see, I've got a tag right here. We can, we can tell you. This is a Munstead English lavender. It's the hardiest of all the lavenders. It's hardier than the Spanish. English is, is the hardiest, then it's French, then it's Spanish. But they all grow here. Could you use it for culinary? Oh yeah, I absolutely use it for culinary. Absolutely. Okay, but it's just, again, I've got, I've grown that in, a, in an oxblood red pot, about this big. The thing is glorious. I mean, it is spectacular. It's designer-esque. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's right at the front door where you walk in going, I'm so glad you're home. Welcome. <laughs> it makes you feel like that as a gardener, you know, tickling. The inside, yeah. I've got that growing in the in the in the ground. I'm curious to know, do, is that something you trim back, or you just you do trim it back? You winter? do trim back most of your herbs, or they'll tend to get rangy, right. keep them more formal looking. Right. I'm just gonna move this back again. Um, but I wouldn't prune it back until after the cold of winter's done. So wait until like March, okay. April. Let let you want to keep that foliage up. This is most perennials are this way. Keep the foliage up so it insulates the core of the heart of the plant. Yeah. And then after the cold is done, typically after about Valentine's, we're done with winter. I mean, stick it, it can still snow, but that bitter bite through your bones kind of cold, that's done. And so then you start trimming up. Most of my pruning I do myself. Most of it's in late February, March. So I do most of my pruning, especially herbs, okay? Yes, this is my work wheelbarrow. It's not a brand new one, okay? It's, it actually gets a workout. Um, generally, I'll use water as mulch, but any compost, screen down to half inch minus. You use small, we don't big chunks, we want small stuff. Uh, I happen to have this bag of potting soil, which is actually better, kind of overkill, but it was, it was open, so I thought, oh, I'll just take that up there. Uh, so, what I'll do is I'll just dump a bag of whatever your favorite thing is. Don't use manure, but mulch, compost, topsoil, any of those, that's good. Okay, and I'll dump that in there. What I'm doing is I'm setting the stage so that when I read the bag, let's say I've got this Arizona wildflower mix one we helped put together for here. It's a great mix for low care, shorter but showy flowers. Um, it says it covers like a thousand square feet. How are you going to spread that seed a thousand feet? I, I can never, once you put them down, wildflowers are so tiny you can't see them. And so what I do is I'll blend them into a bag of organic. So it helps me two things. It helps me to spread it more evenly so I can see where I put it. Secondly, um, it helps to make sure that I get germination. So I get more ground to seed contact. Some of these seeds are very light, airy, almost like feathers. So they want to float. So this tends to get them to touch the soil better so I'll get a better germination rate. And third, most importantly, you don't want the world's most expensive bird seed out there. So it helps to hide the seed underneath the ground so the birds can't, at least they gotta work for it. 
And birds will get some. Oh, they are they're really diligent. But they're out there foraging midwinter. They're desperate. Some of them are truly desperate. They're looking for seeds. So you just sort of throw them out on the ground. They'll all be gone. The other one I found is um, if we get a real heavy rain and you've had it on a hillside, I've had quite a few customers over the years, their neighbors have this beautiful wildflower patch because <laughs> the rain got them to go from here down to there. And so if you put them in some mulch, it helps to keep them blocked. It helps to lock them into place. Just, just some school of hard knocks that we've kind of learned over the years. Okay. So for this, I thought I would take two things. I've got I thought I'd take this drop hardy mix. If you just want to spread something and not water it or do any care, drop hardy. It's a great one, okay? The Arizona mix, you'll probably want to sporadically spit on it every once in a while or pray for more snow and rain. That'll kind of help it. It needs some care, uh, but the drop hardy, it, it'll just go by itself. Then I thought I would add some poppies, which is probably our most famous of all of the wildflowers that we, we grow here, it's the one that seems to everyone talks about. This one's got Coreopsis, Gallardias, and some poppies, but I wanted to front load it with more poppies. So you can, if you like red, you could add more red penstemons or red, you know, you can add more red. If you like pink, you can, I would say skew the mix and make your own mix so it looks the way that you like to see it. So these two, all I do, I just you know, open up. I'll just sprinkle that in. And then what I'm going to do is turn it all together. And that's what I'll spread is this mix. So I'm actually making my own hydro mulch, basically, is what, what we're coming down to. Is there any particular side in the north, south, east, west? They'll do well wherever. Yeah, good question. Um, so where do seeds do better was your question. Is there a better place, north, south, east, west? Uh, generally speaking, flowers do better in the sun. They need that photosynthesis to make more flowers, to make the sugars, to make the, the, the seed heads. So I would say at least six hours of sun would be ideal or more. If you've got less than that, there's specially seed mixes in there that are shade loving, um, that kind of thing. But what I notice is our, at this altitude, the, the mountains, the sun is so intense that even the reflective sun is enough to make things bloom. I'm surprised at how little sun our sun plants will take. It's because the sun is so intense. And usually where you're spreading wildflowers, it's not right underneath the patio or next to the house. Usually it's out there. My guess is most of them are going to do really well out there, including the forested areas like forest trails, timber ridge, those areas. You guys have a lot of pine trees. But by morning to sun, even with that filtered, filtered shade, there's enough sun hitting that part of the garden throughout the, throughout the day that it's usually enough to get them to bloom pretty well for you. In addition to this, let's see if I brought it. Yeah, I did, oh, good. I was in kind of a rush. Christmas trees are in. This is, uh, yeah, let's put it all in. This is uh, Aqua Boost Crystals. This is a water holding crystal. Um, what it's going to do is keep the roots moist so that I get better uh, root take. I'll get more roots too because we've infused these crystals with mycorrhizal fungi, which uh, now, now we're really into it. Mycorrhizal fungi are, are naturally growing in your garden. And so what they do is they feed the roots, they encourage uh, rooting of the plants where the plants go, oh, there's mycorrhizal. Um, the, the, the soil's alive. It must be okay to root here. Let's just root and grow. So it tricks the plant into rooting deeper and more a larger root mass. So it's a naturally occurring thing that feeds off the organics. But anyway, you got seedlings and you want more roots. The, is this is a great. A shelf life or a... As long as it stays dry. Once it gets moist, this thing will swell up and make like this. Will, this will make like a five-gallon tub of of gelatin stuff. So it holds up moisture so as the plant needs it, it releases it back to it. But mainly after the mycorrhizals, and, and, and I want to stabilize the moisture, my white flowers, okay, in the back. Yeah, I have a bunch of um, shrubs and plants in containers already. Yep. Yeah. Is it okay to add the crystals on top of the soil, or does it have to be within 
Good, that's actually an excellent question. Um, is it okay to add these crystals? Can you just see, see if I pick those up or not? You can just see what those look like. Um, is it okay to put these on top of the ground? You'll get more benefit by adding them in the ground. So there for you, I wouldn't put them on top of the ground. <clears throat> I would take a screwdriver or a piece of rebar or something, poke all, try to sprinkle it into the root zone, best you can, okay? With this, I'm just gonna turn it or turn it so I get all that mixture of seed and, and aqua boost together. And then this is what I'm gonna use to spread throughout the yard. And so hopefully, hopefully, break this up. Now, Ken, is that good for a compost sock? Compost what? Sock. Um, That's you can make like your own bed. Your tea and, tea and stuff? Or, oh. No, 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 it's like a oh. removable border. Okay. Yeah. Because I have terrible soil. Yeah, all so of us do. We live to, in the mountains. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of that compost sock. Yes. It's uh, deflated and then you put your soil in it. I use Aqua Boost. What I do in my own gardens, my, my own personal gardens, I buy the biggest container, the quart size, every year, every spring I add it. Uh, and every time I plant, I add a little bit of Aqua Boost into my containers, raised beds, trees, wherever I'm planting. I uh, just did a huge planting for uh, a camp up Iron Springs Road. I mean, there's hundreds of trees. We gave them 10 bottles of aqua boost so that because i knew that in a commercial setting they're going to not care for things as well as as maybe you would in your own personal gardens because it's your quantity and so i wanted there to be a, a, a better take and so that really makes a difference so i always add it every time but especially things like this lawns wildflowers you're putting your new vegetables out really really helps with the germination rate and in spring, it's really dry and windy, so it helps to regulate the moisture on the soil. Yeah. Do those aqua boost crystals just once you put them in an area? Is it forever? Or no. Break down it's not you... forever. Aqua boost crystals, they say, last for five years. I found it lasts for about three years or so. It kind of depends. Uh, you will find some in there, but they find a break down. Okay. So. Yeah, so when you get all done, it's looking pretty good actually. A little bit more. So with this, after I'm all done, you can see the mixture. I'll spread this out in the garden as best I can. And then what I'll do is I'll take my same stiff time rake, I'll turn it upside down so it's, I've got the bar there, and I'll scooch it as best I can and just spread it, helps to spread it even more. And so that technique blending it into a bag of compost. Here I use potting soil. Put your favorite seed in, add aqua boost, um, spread it, and then scooch it as best you can, and then just watch it sip tea, bake cookies, and watch it grow. And then, here's the other thing I've noticed, especially for you folks that have gardeners. Uh, how do I be sensitive with this? Gardeners, well, you don't have a gardener. You probably have a mow and blow guy that just comes in and butchers the yard once a week. As wildflowers come up, they kind of look weedy. It's hard to tell, it is, what is that? Is that weed, is that a flower? What, until it's grown up and you start to see it to bloom. So make sure you instruct them, don't touch this part of the garden, don't stay away from that. I'll do it myself, I want to kind of watch that. So I've had more folks, husbands, I've seen that one where they got the brand new, they got a new uh, weed whacker. <laughs> they love using their equipment, they can't stop. I'm out of my chainsaw. Man. Once I keep cutting, I can't stop. Uh, can make sure you guide whoever's watching that you don't let them mow it down. So just kind of, I've heard that way more than once, where it was growing, about to bloom, and they got whacked off. So just kind of watch that one. They'll come back. I'll spread this out. When I'm all done, I'll add a fertilizer right on top. I'll just spread it as thin as I can. Usually I'll have my hand spreader and I'll just sprinkle it around that area of the garden, uh, and I use the all-purpose plant food. That 744 fertilizer, I'll just put that down, and, and that's pretty much all you're gonna do with that wildflower section. So you're raking it, you're blending up your seed, you're spreading it, you're fertilizing, and that's it. I, I would probably, myself, water it in with a hose, 
just so I get the seed to kind of get into the soil. I'm trying to mainly hide it from the birds. Birds are ferocious when you do well for them. Just trying to get it in the ground so it's 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 camouflaged better. Questions on wildflower? You're basically an expert. So that, that's kind of, I'll go over grasses here in a second and show you all that, yeah. We seem to have a problem with, like, once things start sprouting and growing up, it's either ground squirrels yeah. or mice overnight or rabbits, something just eats Even it quail. All. Quail are notorious in spring. They like eating seedlings. So that's one if you have a lot of vermin. So mice, vol there is a ground vole or field mice. Um, they, they can't eat them. I think it happens overnight. Okay, overnight would be a, 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 a mammal of some sort, small chipmunks or something like that. So if that's the case, get a mix because they'll have their favorites. So they'll tend to leave, leave one some alone and they'll eat the other ones. So they generally don't like galardias, echinaceas, and that kind of stuff. They don't generally like Jupiter's beard, things with a heavy milky scent to it. So herbs they'll generally leave alone, so generally speaking. So kind of watch that one. Or time to set up a, a trap line of uh, nothing but rat traps <laughs> around your wildflower bed, which is what I do, because I'm in that chaparral zone where I've got manzanita and scrub and you know where things live. So I just have they take over. And I have a pretty yard. So I've got waterfalls and they just come in. I'm, I'm an attraction. And so they love my built-in grill. They love my uh, hot tub. They love the cushions to the furniture. Yes. And so I, all those things are expensive. What, if, what are those, like thousand dollar things? Well, I don't want mice to eat them, so I have the trap line. So about every week I capture something. Do rabbits get into the seedlings? They can, rabbits can get into them. That's where it's not sure. Um, yeah, they're, they're gonna like a smorgasbord. So. Yeah, shotgun and some barbecue sauce. <laughs> so yeah, something like that. So anyway, those are some what we call that gardening. You'll have some mistakes, but try it if you need to get rabbits. Easiest way is to fence it off until it's mature enough. Once things are mature, they're less tasty. The tender new seedlings, they're more delicious because they're softer and they're just sweeter. As they get older and mature and crusty and they harden off, the bark gets on them. It's less of a problem. So there'll be a time when you sort of have to protect things a little more than than others. So watch that. Yes. Um, what about the wildflowers, I generally generally seed. I haven't done wildflowers seed in a pot. I generally will do the plants because you've got a defined space, and so you can afford to do you know three plants full of a potty. I think a pot uh, out in the yard is more economical to do seeds because you get so many more seed out there. It just takes a little longer. So when in a container, I like to I like to plant. I mean, easy, easy container gardens. Shoot, what's, there's so many choices. You've got a container garden just like that with three plants. You just make it go. I like using this one a lot. This is kind of my new favorite plant. Just makes a makes a pretty container garden. So gara, that's gara, hookara, the coral bells, and vinca. I use I use all three of these in my own pots. I've got over 50 pots at home. I do a lot of container gardening because I live on a north slope above Eagle Ridge. That's like heavy clay. It's the hardest gardening I've ever done. So everything is either raised beds where I've taken the hillside and just put retaining block in the backfield or pots. That's kind of how I garden. Yeah. Um, I had a So she, she, for those who couldn't quite hear it, or those online, 
Um, she started wildflowers inside. That's now, first of all, I never tell a gardener what they can or cannot do because they always can prove you wrong. Where there's a will, where there's a green thumb, there's a way. And so a master gardener told her she couldn't plant wildflower seed inside. She said, gardener, I'll show you. And she, they all, they're a seed. They'll germinate every time. Every seed will grow inside. It's how do you get them from that darker inside and transplant outside the temperature swings? Well, you just nurtured on them until they took and so her galardias were this big, and her neighbors, which was a master gardener, is they're already they're already dormant. So you you kind of got yours. You probably got a month or two jump start with the seedlings in your in the neighbor that was out. Anyway, you can do that. Like I've never told a neighbor a gardener what they they can't do because every time they'll. I can't grow palm trees. I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll grow up here. I'll show you. Yeah, that. You know, for some reason, I thought you were going to talk about pines today. Would you have time to just kind of quickly rattle off those seven pines that grow best in, um, in See me afterwards, and we can get pine trees. That was last week. Oh. But it was a whole class on nothing but evergreens. Oh, and we could have a side where I can give you a real quick tutorial on. Mainly it's look at walk around the garden center and we're, we've loaded up on evergreens because that's what people are buying now. So we, we have plants year-round and so but it's mainly evergreens now because things are people don't buy twigs in a bucket. They like <laughs> they like foliage in the front. Um, would you put, uh, like cedar mulch on top? Would I put cedar mulch on top? I would not put cedar chips, barks or anything else because the chips I would go half inch flakes are smaller. It will screen down uh, the, the compost. And so our mulch is screened down to, have, to do that. It's made to be a top dressing. Our water is premium mulch. We screen it really heavy so all you're left with is not sticks but fine stuff. If you put big chunks on top of the seedlings, they can't find their way. Seedlings want to die. You get them too wet, they die. If you see enough light, they die. They get too dry, they die. They want to die. So you don't want to inhibit them at all. So we get them as best you can. That's why we go through all this extra work. It's not that much more work, but it's for so much more benefit. But I wouldn't put any kind of wood chips. I wouldn't put horse manure, any of that stuff on top. I would just do this and spread it. And that's all it would do. Yeah. Is it a good idea or would you discourage it to do that mix and lay it down amongst established plants like Russian sages? Oh. Or should you just have an area for wildflowers? No, you can do, okay, so her question was, could you, do you need to spread this out just in an open area, like a garden space or bed, or is it okay to spread around trees and shrubs? She, she mentioned Russian sage, some other wildflower kind of plants that are already out there. Any of the above. This is where the artistic side of, of gardening comes into play. Just realize that you might want to watch what seed mix that you use because some of them are taller, and they might compete too much with things that, you, that are out there. If you're going around shrubs and things, I might go with a, a shorter mix, so it balances more. Um, I've used quite often with my Russian sage specifically, I love Mexican primrose. That, so it's a rangy, weedy, runny, beautiful pink flower, but it only gets this tall. The Russian sage kind of has this V-shape, um, beautiful shape. Love it. Do they? Yeah, my house. So, yeah, but that's a good thing with the uh, Mexican primrose. They might keep them in check some. Otherwise, I'll take over in a nuclear holocaust. There's only going to be ants and, and Mexican primrose left. That's all there'll be left. So, or maybe mint. That's another one that tends to be really aggressive. You want to kind of watch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah. What about after the season? What do you do? Oh, good, very good. So what do we do after the season? So right now, wildflowers are smoking, they're still blooming for another month or so. By the end of the year, they're pretty much, even the galardias, the taller echinaceas, um, they're, they're, they're shutting down. So they're going back, they're gonna hibernate underground. So what I'll do is I'll leave my wildflowers up as long as possible. And then sometime after that January, February, where the snows start to get them to lay down, I'll usually take my, my weed whacker, my lawnmower. I mean, I like to weed whack them so they just seem to go flying everywhere. 
So I'll, I'll be really aggressive and just kind of, I'll purposely try to hit the heads and get them out and just weed whack it down the ground. So seed or flying, they'll actually spread by seed that way. But now you've made, you've taken one seed and turned it into 50 seeds because now you've got a seed head. Now you're getting that to grow. And so I'll just do that way. Um, so that works. And yeah. then would you consider four o'clocks um, wildflower? Because I've got enough seed to give everybody. <laughs> <laughs> do I consider four o'clocks a wildflower? Any plant that reseeds and comes up by itself is a wildflower. Okay. Any plant that you love out in the garden and just appreciate, that's a garden. That's a garden plant. Any plant that comes up in the wrong space, I don't care if it's desirable or not, that's a weed. It's coming up in the wrong place. It needs to be maintained. So you're going to have some maintenance with some of your, this is gardening. You don't just let it grow and take over. You want to maintain it some. So some of the older homes, like I just pulled up, bought an old home over in Government Canyon area as a rental, and it's from an older gentleman. He just couldn't maintain it for a while. Just needed to be cleaned up, we needed a gardener's touch. We just took a chainsaw and cleaned things up and pruned up the trees, and now it looks like a brand new house. That's just some, some basic cleanup, really helps, especially with wildflowers. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. Well, after you do the weed whacking, and you should be a front row gardener. <laughs> this is like you have a lot of questions. That's good. After the weed whacking, then would you go back and put that minus the seed mix sure. on top? Okay, so would I put, after I weed whack it, got my seed to fly everywhere, would I put some more top dress compost or something to kind of ensure? It depends on how, it depends on my gardener feeling inside. If it wasn't quite full enough and I wanted to make sure that I got it to be a full bed faster, then I might. Generally, I just leave it alone. I'm, in my, I'm into wildflowers for the long game, not the short term. So I'll generally just let the seed go. And, and quite honestly, I'm a bird gardener as well. So right now I've been letting my echinaceas seed. I've been letting my gallardias seed. I haven't been deadheading them for a month. Just so they'll put on extra seed heads so that the birds have something to eat this winter. Man, I'm being purposeful with it. So I'll have a lot of birds. I put um, autumn joy sedums in my backyard, a lot of them. Because the early, early spring when they're first coming up, the birds are absolutely desperate. And so they'll use that as a food source and make the plant look terrible. Because they're in, in, eating all the, seed, the the pads of that sedum. It's a water source and it's a food source. The but as soon as the first too. grasses come up, they're off of that and they're done and they're, they're, they're not so desperate. And, they, and my, my autumn joy sedums have been glorious. So I'm, I'm, I'm strategic just because I like birds. And so that's my thing. So I have water for them, and I just I plant plants for them. The whole bottom part of the, the property, I've got grapes and blackberries just for them. I don't harvest them. I let the berries go just for them. And the berries up close to the house, those are mine. If you eat them, I will come after you. And so I've got, we've got this partnership that we do, the birds and I. But we have a lot, so many birds, it's almost ridiculous. I mean, what happens is, if you're into birds, there's, there's weird birds showing up right now. They're migrating. You'll see birds coming in your yard you've never seen all season, but they're there for just two, three weeks, kind of resting, eating at the garden, hydrating, resting, kind of, and then they'll be gone. So it's a really great place because we're on the migratory path. We, we, we see some really unusual birds that more, most folks don't see. That's because we're in Prescott. Okay? Yeah? Along the same lines with butterflies, what about milkweed? Milkweed can be good, so you can add milkweed weed out there. We've got the seed for that. We'll actually have the plants, the wild ones and the decorative ones. And monarchs and swallowtails and painted ladies and all those, they'll actually be attracted to those. So we have this fetish with monarchs, but really we have, we're on the migratory path, not just for birds, but for butterflies as well. And so you'll see a lot of different kinds of fun butterflies. And I think with wildflowers, if you just have wildflowers, you're naturally going to have more wildlife because you're putting a food source out for them as well. So I think that's okay to have that. But you can be more strategic if you want. If you just love butterflies, put, put milkweed out there and you'll have more caterpillars. Yeah, definitely for caterpillars. Okay? I'll hang out 
Uh, but what I have for you, what I'll do is I'll take this mix. I have a bunch of shopping bags. If you want to take some home, maybe you will only do a space like this. But it'll get you a start. But it gave you a visual on how to really go after the best mixes. Oh, before we, before we part, I should mention too, this is for you folks that have uh, open scars. Let's say you got a new house, you put a new septic field in, they just widen this, the, the drive coming into the house. Um, it can be pretty, pretty devastating. We have all the plant material go. Uh, we, we made some mixes for revegetation. It's all the wild grasses specifically. Um, this one we, we put together because folks were asking for the wild grasses, but some of the wheat grass and some of the grass were too tall and were shading out the wildflowers. And so we made a lower mix. So this is buffaloes and blue brahmas, low grasses, Indian rice grass, low grasses, and mix some, some wild flowers in with that so you get a meadow look to it. But we have two or three different grasses, just grasses. This one seems to be the number one seller. So it's, it's uh, Indian rice grass, mainly and some wildflowers. You want more grassy, meadowy look, you can do that too. So but look for a wild grass. Don't look for bluegrass or fescues or rye. You're, you're, those are lawns. These are wild grasses you let go. Okay? You treat them exactly the same way. Grasses are never firewise unless you water them. Or you keep it mowed down so that but I would say low grasses are fire wise. Right? Now we get into debate. I help break the fire code. So. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So wild, wild, wild grasses that stay low, you'll be okay. The key with wildfire with wild fire is to keep the fire on the ground. As long as it's rolling on the ground, the firefighters can take it out and deal with it. The second it jumps up into the canopies, all we all do, including the firefighters, is run because it, it is uncontrollable. That's why we control ladders. And I got a whole class on nothing but wild, wildfires. I teach classes on this. But you just want to keep islands, keep things together. But most of your wild grasses are going to be fine. Most of your wild flowers are going to be fine, especially if you're planting them in a groups or, or an island effect, because they can control it and go, don't spread past this. And we've got rock around that. So we could have a separate debate or look for the spring garden class because we do a whole class of just wild, wildfire uh, for that class, okay? All right, now Hank, maybe I could have, maybe we'll, we'll just tag team this. I'll control the shovel, <laughs> and you can grab the bag, and then you just hold it open, and I'll, I'll shovel some in, and we'll go until we run out. Is that okay?